So the end is nigh. Nigeria's political parties have only days left to convince the electorate to support them to get past whatever distraction is left to inhibit their ability to get their message across and to play whatever dirty or clean tricks they have left in their arsenal. Many pundits are predicting a big turnout if insecurity, naira scarcity and fuel shortage allow. But that's as far as the predictions go. No one's quite sure of how the people will speak, but we know that for some there will most certainly be electoral disappointment. And sooner or later, someone will emerge victorious. But for whom will that bell toll? Well, the policy strategist, Arise News analyst and founder and executive director of Agora Policy, Waziri Adio, has crafted a well-wrought article highlighting why he thinks a number of issues make the 2023 presidential election a series of contests within a contest. And Waziri Adio joins me now in the studio. Great to see you, Waziri. Same here. Um, you mentioned in that article the issues you think make this ballot a series of contests within a contest. Let's start with the first one, which is the accuracy of pre-election polling in predicting a possible winner in this election. What are your thoughts on that? You see it as a sort of contest between history and science. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, first, let me say that uh, because we've had a very long campaign period, mm. uh, because also um, there's a lot of interest uh, and there's a lot at stake, uh, we've had um, so many polls in this election. In fact, this election, electionary period, could pass for the most polled mm. ever in our history and is understandable for the reasons I've, 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 I've stated. You know, so most of the polls, um, if you look at them, um, mm. you can say, you know, they are predicting that a particular candidate will win, right? Um, some of them will say it will win outrightly, um, so maybe we don't even need to go to the polls, you know, since we know the result. And some of them will say, we'll put a caveat, uh, either that, um, you know, this election is likely to go into a runoff, which is another issue which, you know, I, I mentioned, in the mm. sense that um, the conditions stated in the Constitution will not be met even uh, by the front uh, runner, or that there are some numbers outside uh, in terms of uh, the respondents uh, that they didn't disclose their choice or said they were unde uh, uh, undecided. Mm. And that number ranged from like 30% uh, to more than 50%. And because of that, even when somebody it is makes the whole thing unpredictable, unpredictable yeah. you know, it's uh, you know, uh, inconclusive, so to say. Mm. So, but you know, uh, when these polls come out, there's usually a, a contestation about you know, whether the polls should be taken as gospel truth or whether they don't make sense. And that's why I said it's a contest between science you know, and history. Mm. For those who contest them, what the first thing we need to establish is that <coughs> people take a position mostly based on their preference or their bias. But if you take that out, there are people who also take a position based on their reading of the state of play <coughs> or their appreciation of history. Mm. So when they, those who are looking at the historical patterns, historical voting patterns and all of that, uh, so those are the ones that uh, you tag in terms of history. Um, the people who are looking at, okay, this is a scientific polling and it should reflect the state of play, those are the ones on the side of science. But the point I also made there is that neither the history nor the science is unimpeachable mm. because you are dealing with human beings. Because human beings, as we know, uh, they are not physical objects. They change. They mm -hmm. change their minds. Um, so um, you can't rely on history. Absolutely. And also you cannot rely on and that's science. That's a very good you point. And, uh, and you always end yeah. um, each segment yeah. of that article, and rightly so, by saying you will never know until the results of the election are fully yeah. in. And that is, of course, a fact. Yeah. The reason why I made that is that, you know, uh, so, much, so much passion, so much mm. emotion, uh, you know, uh, have been invested mm. in contesting uh, the polls, you know, either celebrating them, you know, or, or, or dismissing them. And as I say, this is not this is not necessary. Uh, at the end of the day, we're going to know. Uh, we're going to know uh, when mm. the votes are in. Well, yeah. let's look at the second issue that you raised, which is the likelihood of a runoff. You mentioned that a yeah. few minutes ago in the election, and that is based on the tightness of the race. Yeah. Um, in a runoff, is a runoff more likely in your assessments than victory at the first ballot, based on your, the analysis you gave in that article? Okay, let, let me flip it this way. Mm. Uh, let's go back to, you know, why is it that people are saying 
there's likelihood of a runoff. Mm. Um, they are saying there are like, there's likelihood of a runoff because there are two conditions um, set in Section 134 of the 1999 Constitution for a winner to emerge on the first ballot. The first condition is that when you have more than two candidates, um, the candidate with the highest number of votes, mm. highest, uh, it doesn't matter if it's just you know higher than the next one by one vote, right? Um, the candidate with the highest number of votes, that's the, uh, the first condition. And the candidate that meets 25% in 24 states mm. and FCT. So because of the tightness of the race, there are people who believe that um, this might not be possible. But there are also people who believe that it is possible, mm. right? You know, so um, what do I think? It doesn't matter. We know the answer uh, uh, maybe from Sunday, uh, mm. next week. You know, but uh, there's, some, there's a very important point that I think um, um, uh, we gloss over. Even let's say there will be a runoff. And by the way, I like I said that they're actually prepared for a mm. runoff, you know, which is also good. And there are some people who are making the point about runoff as if it's totally inevitable that definitely we're going to go to a runoff. Uh, but, but there are certain points uh, we need to make around the runoff. The first thing is that we've never had a runoff mm. in, in our history as, as, as you know, a running a presidential system. The closest we got to having a runoff uh, was in 1979. And as you know, there were five parties that contested. Um, the party that led scored 33.77%. The party that came second, that's MPN, the party that came second scored 29.18%, uh, uh, um, uh, mm. right? And the party that came third, you know, scored 16.75%. Uh, you know, so it might be that close. But the issue in 1979, which is also uh, close to this, was that the Constitution in Section 126 of the 1979 Constitution said that apart from scoring the highest, you also have to meet the spread mm. uh, of 25% in two-thirds of the states. As you remember, in 1979, we had 19 states. Yes. And two-thirds of 19 happened to be 12 to third. Yep. Uh, so I will all went to the Supreme Court to say Shagari yeah, did not meet the spread. 12 or 13. Yes, yes. yes because yeah. actually uh, Shagari scored 25% in 12 states. Mm. But in the 13th state, which is Kano, he scored 19.97%, mm. which is now up to 25%. So the case that I would always making was that, you know, states are not divisible. So if it's 12 to 3rd, there has to be 13. Yeah. So it's 25% in 13 states. And um, 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 uh, MPN was arguing that, no, it is 12 states, then 25% in the 2 third of the 13 states. Mm. Uh, the, the Supreme Court found in favor of, 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 of MPN. Of, of, of MPN. Yeah. So, so that's uh, another angle we need to look at. But in case there's actually a runoff, there could be a, a runoff and a runoff, yes. couldn't there? Th there's yeah. a confusion about who makes the runoff. Mm. Many people, if you ask them, um, so if this election is not one of the first ballot, who will make the runoff? They will tell you the candidates with the, uh, the, the top two, right? But not necessarily so. You could be the top two, but it could also not be the top two. Mm. Why do I say so? Um, the Constitution in Section 134, Section 3, uh, that's the 1999 Constitution now, says that the candidate that scores the highest number of votes will be the first draw. Then the candidate that scores the majority of votes in most of the states. Mm. Majority, as defined in that context, I'm not a lawyer, so but this is my own layman interpretation. Majority means that 50% and above, right? So uh, you can have a party that will, score, that will score the second highest or the third highest, but might not be the one that will have the majority of the votes in most of the states. Let me give you an example. You can have a party that scored the second highest, right? Uh, but a party that scored the second, the third, or the fourth might actually have 50% in more states mm. than, you know. So this is something I think INEC needs to educate people about so that when we get to that runoff, there won't be this cry about, oh, it's a Joro yes, and all of that. Because that, that, yeah. that's another thing that could get mired in yes, confusion. You know, yes, and it could, yeah. it, this is something that could, can trigger people. Yeah. The other thing is that when you have a runoff, mm. the first runoff, it doesn't mean that whoever scores the higher of the two will die, become automatically uh, the winner. We can actually have a third ballot in the sense that if you have still have to meet two conditions mm. in, the second, uh, the, in the second ballot, you have to score 50% plus, right? Then you also have to still meet the spread requirement. 
If that is not met, then there will be a third ballot. Mm. The, it's at that point that you now go to simple majority. Yes, yes. So, so it's very important that we should yeah. prepare for. That, that's a very this. important yeah. point to make. Now let's yes. look briefly at the third issue you raised in that article and which you believe will be tested in this election. Yes. And that's the contest between the old and the new, or yes. as you put it, between the traditional and the revolutionary parts to electoral victory. Flesh that out for us. Okay, uh, fantastic. Um, the, 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 the traditional way of, 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 of winning presidential power in Nigeria mm. is that you rely on structure, on parties that have the spread. Don't forget that you know, it's not just the, 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 the highest number of votes that you need, you also need to have the spread. Mm. You know, so um, in most instances, in all instances, you know, uh, in, uh, in our history, even when you go back to 1979, um, Shagari won, not just because he won it. You know, by the way, in 1979, there were three parties from the North. Shagari was able to win because he went beyond winning in the North to winning in, mm. in the present uh, 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 South South. Right. So, so you need to have that spread. You need to have that structure. So mm. that's the traditional part. The revolutionary part is that, no, you don't need to have the party that, that is in power, uh, that has uh, at the power at the federal level, at the state level, at the local government level, even to the world level. Right. You can actually do it with an individual. Right. Uh, if you have the right individual that resonates with people. So you don't have to be beholden to that structure. Mm. Uh, you can actually have a structureless system uh, but that rotates or that revolves around a person, right? So well, there are some, some parties will be happy to hear you. Yes, and, 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 and uh, now with, with what mm. is happening with uh, Mr. Peter Obi, because you can actually say mm. Labour Party is structureless. Mm. Uh, in 2019, mm. the candidate of Labour Party scored only 5,000 votes. Right. So that party to have thrown up somebody that has galvanized, you know, uh, so much um, mm. uh, uh, of, of the society, uh, you know, um, is, is popular in, in at least two zones. You know, he has the support of the youth and mm. all of that. So, so, you know, so that's, that's also a contest. Uh, but would that be enough? Some people believe it will be. Some people believe it will not. That's also one of the questions that will be set to. But there's also a wrinkle which I would like to leave here. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, because sometimes when you see something, uh, this is also the benefit of history. Uh, we also need to look, is this completely new? Or uh, we've seen something like this before. There's somebody who is, by the way, not contesting that because it's time bad. But when he joined the race in 2003, it was like a hurricane, right? In 2003, 2007, 2011, Buari was permanently carrying 12 million votes mm. in his breast pocket, right? But well, he didn't have the spread. Yeah, but he didn't have the spread. Uh, and the, the 12 million votes, fanatical, cortic mm. followers, but they were restricted to the Northwest and to the Northeast. Right? The only time, and don't also forget that in 2011, he ran on the, on, the, on, the, on the platform of a completely new party, CPC, formed around him. Mm. But it wasn't enough. The only time that was enough for him was when he formed an alliance with people from the other side of the country. Yeah, but which, which of the parties do you think? Because it, it sounds a lot like the sort of thing we're seeing with the NNPP, isn't it? I mean, it doesn't have 12 million votes, probably not, yeah. but it has a, a, a very fanatical concentration of, of people uh, who support it in, I, I, in, in I, the I, North. I, I will actually think that the person that you can compare to a Buhari now uh, is Mr. Peter Obi, right? In the sense that uh, in the South is for obvious reasons. Yeah, but they will and argue also, that they have also, a that they have a spread across the country. I mean, I, I, that's so also that's one of the things that we tested. Mm. Whether that spread goes beyond the South South and the South. Well, East. yeah, obviously that will uh, be tested you know, at uh, the election. Whether, you know, so, yeah. but but, but the, 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 the thing is that you know this is a very the point I'm trying to make is that there are so many contests mm. within a contest, right? Uh, and there are so many issues beyond just picking. Um, uh, the presidential candidates, so many ideas that have become, that sure. have generated a lot of passion that we well, tested. That and, but all of this uh, predicated ten on, on, on two assumptions, mm. right? The first one is that the election will be free and fair. And the second, very important for all of us, not just for the contestants, is that all the players will play by the rules of mm. the game. That's a very important point. But you know, as they say, as ever in politics, beware of the pundits <laughs> and the politicians making assertions yeah. in the unpredictable environment 
that is Nigeria, their fuel could run out. But I don't think so in your case. I think this no, makes, no, politics th this is, makes politics a lot of it's, sense. It's uh, really unpredictable. Waziri, thank you as always. Waziri Adio is the uh, founder and executive director of Agora Policy. He's also an Arise News analyst and a policy strategist. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. That's it for this edition of Arise Prime Time. Join us again tomorrow. From me and the entire team here in Abuja, bye-bye and thank you for watching.